Let me welcome you all back to our second session that moves forward a bit in time. While, as you've noticed, our time frames get, they go where they need to go to explain what we want to explain. But this time we're a little bit more from 1940s forward. And once again, to a degree, we will start in Mexico. But by the end of our session, we will be squarely in the Mexican-American communities of the United States. So, our first presenter this afternoon is Emilio Corral from the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City, um, where he teaches a variety of things in history, politics, international relations, but I know Emilio best because he completed his doctorate at Georgetown back seven or eight years ago with a fantastic dissertation on the middle class in Mexico City. Um, looking at how they juggled their own deeply religious commitments with the fact that they worked for the secularizing state we've heard so much about um, earlier today. And in the interim, I want to brag because sometimes historians, and yeah, in the face of pretty crappy job markets, find really important and creative things to do. So for nearly a decade, he was the director of international programs for CREFAL, which is a Mexican government-run, UN-sanctioned program to promote adult education across the Americas. Um, but he's come back to the teaching world, and we have driven him, and we have drawn him here today, and his talk is entitled Between Catholic Tradition and the Nationalist State, uh, the Mexico City Middle Class from 1940 to 1968. Enjoy it. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor John Tutino and uh, Julian Ben, our organizers, for kindly of inviting me to share with you this presentation, uh, which I called uh, Between the Catholic Tradition and the Nationalist State, the Mexico City Middle Class between 1940 and 1968. I have some images that I wanted to share with you. There is not uh, necessarily a, a, a direct correlation between all the texts that I'm going to present, but uh, I think they are sort of a reference about some of the aspects that I will be talking about. Um, uh, this presentation focuses on the relationship between the Mexican state, U.S. economic and cultural influence, and reactions of some, some social sectors defending the Catholic and Hispanic heritage, such as the Christian family movement, uh, as Mexico faced uh, rapid urban expansion and political challenges between 1940 and 1970. Uh, professional education, the bureaucratic expansion of the state, industry and the development of urban trades have been basic aims for social transformation in Mexico. Actually, between 1940 and 1970, it was a period also known as the Mexican miracle. Uh, the symbiosis between the expanding middle class and the state prompted both uh, uh, to seek the conciliation of their places amid profound contradictions in the Mexican political and economic system. In such a context, gaining consistent middle class support was of the utmost importance for the regime. However, the middle class sectors of Mexico struggled to preserve some of their most important cultural values, family, religion, and nationalism, among others. I know that in academic literature, uh, very often the middle classes of the countries are considered under some of pejorative sense, but uh, actually in the case of Mexico and most of Latin America, the middle classes have represented uh, some of the uh, important contradictions and paradoxical uh, aspects of the relation uh, between the state and uh, the social communities. And they have added important uh, leverage in political and economic terms. Uh, so as the Mexican middle class grew at the intersection of tradition, the state and the United States, uh, the strongest thread of tradition came 
from the cultural war of religion and the family ways it promoted. Catholicism is a historical legacy rooted in Mexico's colonial foundations, it endured as it adapted during the era of political and cultural conflicts that shaped the 19th century. Uh, during and after the revolution of the early 20th century, the Mexican middle class retained a powerful commitment to Catholic religiosity while facing the challenge of modernity, urbanization, and social change. Uh, middle class Catholics often became uneasy uh, with the truth that the Mexican church had implicitly agreed upon with the Mexican legislature. In our previous panel, we saw how um, Catholicism often clashed uh, with the uh, new lay governments, the post revolutionary governments. Uh, but during this period, we find some, some kind of harmony and um, intersection um, between um, the Catholic institutions and the government, and the PRI led state, of course. Um, beginning in the 1940s, the PRI led political system changed its political discourse, actually. Uh, President, President Lazaro Cárdenas' discourse of social reform and left-leaning trends was replaced by Manuela Villa Camacho's discourse of national unity and political stability. Also, Villa Villa Camacho's relatively peaceful relation with the church was being built, in spite of many legal limitations that prevented church interference in political matters. The state actually found that the church played an important role as a catalyst for social unity and a strong reference for individual behavior. While avoiding being openly associated with religion and the church, presidents like Gavila Camacho and Miguel Alemán Valdez acknowledged and even stimulated the social importance of the church. By the time prominent members of the Mexican religious hierarchy, like Archbishop Luis Maria Martinez, were often seen sharing public, public dinners with politicians and powerful entrepreneurs, and even making comments on Mexican public life and the importance of keeping traditional values and national unity. This reflected what some authors have called an new modus vivendi between the state and the Catholic Church. So if religion was an important element of middle class identity in Mexico, the middle class being PRI led the state was careful enough to avoid confrontations with the church beyond political rhetoric. Actually, when asked about his position on the Catholic religion, President Manuel Avila Camacho had openly asserted, I am a believer. Such assertion indeed marked an important turning point in the relation between the government and the church. The church was not considered any longer a symbol of reactionary danger undermining the Mexican Revolution. Instead, Avila Camacho found in the church a potential ally in countering conservative national action party, the Tractors, and that potential support was to be strongly capitalized by Avila Camacho's successor, Miguel Alemán Valdez. <clears throat> Although Miguel Alemán did not offer any reliable information or open expression of his own religious sentiments, and he sought to be identified with the progressive left, his actions spoke by themselves concerning the re new relation with the church. For example, he reformed Constitutional Article 3, eliminating cardinal reform, which originally asserted that education should be socialist. On the other hand, Alemán created the necessary ambiguities in Article 3 for the church to offer private education as long as it was not directly or openly associated with religious doctrine. Thus, Alemán worked on building an improved relation with the Mexican middle class in its traditional devotion to family, Catholic religion and education. The symbiosis between government and the church was reinforced with the president Adolfo Ruiz Cortines' politics of austerity and morality, as a reaction to Miguel Alemán's government image of rampant cor corruption. Ruiz Cortines distanced from his predecessor building a new image of the government. This trend fitted nicely with the church and conservative middle class expectations for the country. By the time, Mexico City's mayor Ernesto Ruchurto limited operations of nightclubs and urban spectacles. New censorship regulations on movies and theater seem to have been expressly designed to satisfy the most moralizing expectations of all sorts 
of middle class conservative social reformers and Catholic Church followers. Adolfo López Mateos, the presidential successor of Luis Martínez, Uh, like his predecessor, avoided direct conflict with the church and was highly supportive of the urban and educated middle class. However, his educational policies that created the free textbooks for elementary education students brought about major inconformity and contestation among the conservative middle class. The problem was that the free textbooks reinforced a PRA's style, lay conception of life and patriotism opposed by many among the conservative middle class. As a result, broad middle class movements opposing the textbooks expanded through Mexico, claiming that the government was interfering with parents' right to decide their sons' and daughters' education. Uh, Gustavo Díaz Ordaz, the last president of the period here analyzed, faced growing inconformity among his students and the youth in general. During his presidential term, the political and economic contradictions of the regime became clearer than ever before awakening his strong student contestation against the government. With the Ordaz, the regime's authoritarianism seemed to reach its pinnacle. The government lowered the budget for higher education while harshly repressed protesting his student. Even though the Ordaz developed a strong relation with the private sector and the church, he had his highly repressive implementations culminating in the October 1968 of the local massacre brought him growing middle class opposition. As a result, the Christian family movement and the PAN were among those openly raising their voice denouncing government successes. Now I'm going to enter into a key topic for uh, Catholic middle class opposition to the government, which is the Christian family movement. The movement found its origins in Father Pedro Richard's work in Argentina and Uruguay by 1948. Father Richard promoted the integration of a Catholic family movement that favored many family meetings to strengthen Catholic family life. The movement expanded to Mexico in 1958 by means of Catholic middle class families who brought Father Richards to Mexico in order to settle the basis for the movement. Mexican middle class families supporting the movement sought to face what they perceived as growing threats against tradition and family unity coming from the late state and growing U.S. cultural influence upon national society. Such families found in the Christian family movement the means for creating strong and independent social networks for practical purposes beyond the strictly confessional or church institutional perspectives. Among those purposes, they include censoring government management of the media and promoting direct public opinion to make the government accountable for blatant corruption and socioeconomic inequalities in the country. The movement was also concerned with other subjects such as the influence of U.S. culture in, on the Mexican middle class families, particularly in the matter of divorce and what they consider lack of attention to children and the youth. They envision materialism and rupture with tradition as the most important trouble hurting Mexican society, particularly the social status seeking middle class. The movement expressed an editorial in its periodical brochure. I'm going to read it in Spanish, uh, it makes uh, better sense in its original language. Pero es que no hemos comprendido como padres de familia que la máxima empresa de cada uno, la empresa máxima en estos tiempos debe ser la de educar a nuestros hijos. Ya que para los padres de familia actuales, nuestra única preocupación es la de aumentar los fondos de nuestra chequera, muchos creen que en ella tienen las respuestas para el problema de la educación, y así pues se inscriben a sus hijos en el colegio más caro y exclusivo de México, y están seguros y convencidos de que entre más cara sea la colegiatura, mejor estarán cumpliendo con su obligación y creen que la escuela puede hacer lo que ellos no hacen. Qué triste manera de entender nuestra obligación como padres. Revela claro esta la época materialista en la que vivimos. It's making a clear critique against U.S. influence, materialism and consumerism in Mexican society. Part of the U.S. cultural influence included increasing attempts Uh, by Protestants and evangelical practitioners to expand their influence to Latin America. During the 1950s and 1960s, strong waves of North American missionaries entered Mexico and all Latin American countries seeking new practitioners. 
This process found its most immediate antecedent in the work of the Sommer Institute for Languages, which was allowed to begin operations in Mexico during Lázaro Cárdenas' presidential administration. The Institute translated the Protestant Bible into a broad variety of indigenous languages and offered the basis for the expansion of a diversity of Protestant movements in Mexico, like Baptists, Evangelists, Anglicans, Adventists, Jehovah Witnesses, and Mormons, among many others. While poor and rural Mexican communities offered major potential for a positive impact of Protestant evangelizing work, middle class homes, mainly in urban areas, were less willing to even just listen to Protestant propaganda. Commonly, the doors of the middle, of middle class homes used to advance good size signs at the rentals, like the one that Julia showed us in her presentation. Este es un hogar decente, no se admite propaganda comunista o protestante. Consolidating middle class rejection to what they called foreign religious doctrines was also part of the movement's main objectives. During the 1960s, the movement suffered major transformations as the Catholic faith received the modernizing influence of Pope John XXIII with its 1961 encyclical Mother et Magistra. The 1950s Cold War context increased expanding influence of communism throughout Eastern Europe and Latin America. By late 1950s, the Cuban Revolution shook the Latin American region with its socialist and anti-Catholic trends. Such process became highly influential behind university walls. Many among the younger, many among the younger and most educated middle-class members in Mexico were increasingly atheistic or at least skeptical to Catholicism. In this context, the Catholic Church strove to keep its influence and better respond to the new challenge. On this, an editorial in the Christian Family Movement Journal says, La juventud tiene muy mala fama, bebe, fuma y baila el twist. <laughs> Fornica, roba automóviles y gasta dinero. Frente a la nueva ola, los adultos parecen sentirse consternados, aterrados y arrollados. Tienen miedo. Sin embargo, los jóvenes de hoy no son tan terribles. Es más, muy pocas veces han sido tan razonables como lo son en la actualidad. Accordingly, the movement widened its openness to new trends like rock and roll and so to have a better understanding of the causes behind youth rebelliousness. In so doing, the movement acknowledged that adults, and particularly a deteriorating political and economic system under the PRI rule, were responsible for youth disenchantment and inconformity. By the time the movement reflected its members' self-reflection as a social group that should better respond to the reality of society. This was a society uh, with sharp socioeconomic inequalities and broad geographic areas, mainly rural, suffering the problems of marginalization and poor development. Thus, the movement's members began shaping a middle-class self-conception as potential reformers of society in a messianic way. They felt having the patriotic and religious duty of openly questioning some of the most important problems in society and awakening other social groups' awareness about the situation. Accordingly, their confessional practice should not any longer be merely expressed in a spiritual or immaterial realm. Instead, they sought to gain major incidence on clearly economic and practical issues at least by means of social critique and political participation. Uh, the social awareness in important sectors of the church had a profound impact on the Mexican Catholic middle class. They perceived the profound contradictions in the Mexican political system. And underlying the Christian family movement's critical perspective, there was a traditional position from which the Mexican state and consumerism were criticized. The, this perspective mainly found the roots of the problem in excessive materialism, and consumerism that followed imported, mod imported models from the United States middle class, instilled by the mass media and the state. On this, uh, Javier Cacho, SJ, a Jesuit, and a Christian family movement's opinion maker said, La sociedad de consumo en la que estamos y en la que desenvolvemos nuestra vida nos empuja incesantemente a desear más, a comprar más, a tener más. Un bombardeo sistemático de la publicidad que cañonea por todos los medios de comunicación masiva Cine, TV, radio, prensa, nos persuade al consumo. Insensiblemente la publicidad de ventas 
nos ha persuadido que nuestra vida es para tener más. In the end, Father Cacho made parents and teachers responsible for using conformity in a society that seemed to betray the human essence in the quest for material satisfaction. Um, I'm just going to jump uh, ahead. In the Encuentros Diocesanos de Dirigentes by 1969 and 1970, organized by the Archdiocese of Mexico, there is evidence on how the church, the institutional church, sought to gain major control over the movement. Even though during the Encuentros there was an important level of criticism against recent Mexican political and economic developments, we are talking about the Tlatelolco massacre in 1968, the Catholic hierarchy sought to tighten the relation between local teams of the Christian family movement and regional zones supervised by priests and church authorities. This meant that uh, for middle class members of the Christian family movement, um, there was less interest in continuing as part of the movement because uh, previous to this uh, major institutional control of the church, they were uh, freer to express their points of view and criticize the politics of the state. Um, so from the 1970s onward, the movement decayed and uh, their, their incidence was um, less critical and less opposed uh, to the government. So um, by the early 1970s, major institutional control of the church became an important factor behind its transformation into a maybe more popular movement, more popular working class movement, but much less critical to the state. Thank you. Thank you, Emilio. Our next presenter is David Tamayo. Um, he received his PhD, and I will say our next two speakers finished their PhDs at Berkeley under Margaret Chowning, who is a major scholar of the Church of Mexican History and is writing a book on the history of Mexican church from time of memorial to yesterday. Um, of that sort. Um, David is currently a postdoctoral fellow in history at Santa Clara University in California, and he's currently working on turning his dissertation into a book entitled Remaking the Right, Mexico's Middle Classes and the Rise of Transnational Conservatism. Mexico. I'll show you a map in just a second. 
Um, but to understand the relevance of these service clubs, of these uh, philanthropic organizations for businessmen, I will say a little bit about the role of Catholic organizations um, in anti-clerical Mexico, roughly between the 1910s and into the 1930s. Um, and especially relevant are the Knights of Columbus for, for my purposes today. Uh, before talking about uh, these service clubs, so this is more or less a visual outline of, of my talk. So I'll talk a little bit about the Knights of Columbus, Rotary, and then the Scholars of Friendship. And I'm focused primarily in, in the city of Monterrey, northeastern Mexico. Um, and I want to say that my research uh, and is animated really by a curiosity to understand how conservatives, how Catholics in urban Mexico um, voice their political and their cultural views uh, after the revolution, so after the 1920s and, and, and throughout really the, the reign of the PRI that uh, Emilio uh, introduced us to. And I think it's an important question for several reasons. Uh, one is the revolution, among the several things that it attempted to do was first to weaken influence of the Catholic Church, which uh, we talked about in, in the first panel. Um, and second was to empower labor, um, adopt redistributionary policies. Uh, three, it had a cultural agenda, like promoting the Hemismo, which I'll say a little more in a second. Um, and, and also a fourth one is to really limit political opposition of, of any kind, both on the right and left. So under these circumstances, how did middle-class conservatives, Catholics in urban Mexico express their cultural and political values? That's really the big question that I'm, that I'm tackling. So some Mexicans resisted the state's anti-clericalism, uh, for instance, through church-linked uh, organizations. Uh, and there's a variety of them. And, and uh, uh, we um, heard about some of them first panel, um, uh, but also, uh, and then they led these boycotts and protests against the state's anti-clericalism, um, and others opted uh, to take uh, up arms, as, as we uh, uh, already discussed, in which occurred in the Fiscal War, and later the Segunda in the 1930s. Um, but with rather mixed results, I would say, um, if not disastrous, right, and this was a very bloody encounter and, and, and uh, maybe not appealing for all Mexicans to take up arms or to um, lead boycotts if you're a middle class uh, Mexican with a family and a small business. So that, you know, these are important decisions that one has to make. So um, others chose to challenge the state uh, via political parties, uh, such as the you know, Partido Nacional de Revolucionista, the United States of Concelos, um, in 1929, and later the Sinarquistas that Julia talked about earlier in 1937, and later the fund uh, in 1939. And so both of these paths, political parties, Catholic organizations, had you know, their positive, but also there, there were very important limitations to resisting, challenging the state through these means. Um, and particularly if you were affiliated to Catholic, to Catholic organizations, it could entail becoming targets of state repression, or you become blacklisted, or you lose your job if you're a part of a, a state bureaucracy. So, and this was the case for militant Catholic lay associations such as the Knights of Columbus, and I'll say a few more um, things about them. Um, so the Knights of Columbus, if, if uh, some of you don't know, or, um, is a lay brotherhood founded also here in the United States, like uh, um, but expanded also like Rotary uh, outside of the United States. Um, and in Mexico, the first group was chartered in 1905, um, and on the eve of the Civil War, there were more or less 50 councils, that's what they're called, the, the individual groups throughout Mexico, with more with about a membership of 6,000. And so, who joined the Knights of Columbus? Um, here's an image of the Knights of Columbus in Guadalajara. Uh, from looking at several rosters of the founding um, councils uh, in Mexico, what I discovered was a pretty clear pattern uh, in larger cities, particularly cities with, with 
business and industry, um, like Guadalajara, Puebla, but especially Monterrey. Um, and what I found was that a majority of the people who joined the Knights of Columbus were employers, they were industrialists of considerable importance in their city, and in some cases, in the country. Um, and here, I'll give you just a, a breakdown of the, the Knights of Columbus in Guadalajara. Um, this uh, donut-shaped graph, uh, I think I was hungry when I was <laughs> um, but, but anyway, um, the, the, the green, the, sh the shades of green represent more or less um, individuals who were employees, um, they were farmers, and, and their students also. So just kind of a, 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 a particular group of people who weren't necessarily um, in a position of economic power. So to speak. And then you have, a, I think, 13% were members of the church. But the remaining 60% you have industrialists, you have lawyers, you have dentists, you have merchants, people who rent out property. So a majority of these individuals were, were people of importance in their cities. Now, in the case of Monterrey, um, here, I don't have a similar donut, but I do have a, just a snapshot because this is, in fact, if, as far as I can tell, the largest council in this period in Mexico is in Monterrey, and I think that's important for those of you who know anything about um, Mexican history. Um, so anyway, here's a snapshot. These names that you see here um, are kind of like the industrial titans of Mexico, right? The DuPonts and the Rockefellers of, of Mexico. Um, and I want to emphasize the, the last person there, Eugenio Garza Sada. If you know anything about Mexican history, he's a Antonio Century. He's a very important person in terms of the uh, industry, um, the founding of a, a private university. So he's a, a very important person. Well, he was also a founding member of the Knights of Columbus. Um, and uh, let's see. <clears throat> and here you see in the slide, uh, you know, the institution of the notice of the, of, the, of the council in Monterrey. On the right, you see this picture of the Banco Mercantil de Monterrey. Um, and the reason I have that there is because this is where the Knights of Columbus would have their meetings uh, on the third floor. So um, literally, the church and capital were sharing the same. <laughs> they know where power. Was. Exactly. Well, and they were on the third floor, so they were on top of the bank. So I mean, you know, you can draw the kinds of uh, analysis. And so very uh, symbolic, I think. So, but the problem with the Knights of Columbus. Um, if you're a middle class or if you're an industrialist or an elite, um, is that during the Cristiada, as um, Julia shows in, in, in some of her work, um, you know, Catholic organizations like the Knights of Columbus participated in the rebellion um, and uh, thus became targets of the state. This, this had consequences, right? We're talking about this and the consequences. Um, it, the, the Brotherhood in Large, largely speaking, went underground and became inactive um, after the instead of the war. Um, and it never really picked up uh, until after the 1950s, uh, but under a very different um, uh, context, as Media was, was uh, uh, mentioning earlier. But at the same time, um, there's a parallel development going on in Mexico. American service clubs, particularly Rotary, started to expand in Mexico and were being founded throughout the country. And it really occurs at right in the middle of the Cristero War. So from what I found in my research is, although not necessarily entire councils of Knights of Columbus were joining the Rotary Club, that's not what happened, but certainly in, throughout Mexico, Key individuals from the Knights of Columbus would later join the Rotary Club and the Lions Club and other service clubs. Um, in some cases, like Monterrey, you do see a very clear overlap um, between the Knights of Columbus and the Rotary Club in the 1920s and into the 30s. So, a Rotary Club of uh, Monterrey more or less had somewhere between 35 and 40 uh, members, depending on the year close to a third the former Knights of Columbus. Now, what this means, I argue, in, in part in, in uh, 
right? And my work is that service clubs, I think, provided some former Catholic activist men an organization through which they could advance indirectly their political, cultural, religious beliefs. And the, and the interesting thing is that officially the, the Rotary Club um, was and is an apolitical, non-sectarian organization. And, and this basic but crucial uh, feature is, is important because the Mexican state believed that to be so. So in, in other words, uh, its apolitical character provided the perfect cover uh, for some Catholics, particularly like in the case of Monterrey, to push back against some of the more unpopular policies of the state. So for instance, and here's uh, an example for you, um, during the Cardenas presidency, um, there was a famous incident uh, in 1935 and 1936 in which these employers were opposed to uh, these uh, state-backed unions and there were massive protests and fights on the streets and, and boycotts and all kinds of uh, things going on. Well, in these protests, the Rotary and, and Lions Club of Monterrey participated actively in, in these protests and, and denouncing, um, careful, careful to denounce communist agitators, not really directing their attacks against Cardenas per se, but claiming that this was the work of some kind of communist um, uh, uh, takeover. And so, as members of this international organization, the Rotary Club, uh, the Monterrey Rotarians thought, well, if, since we are part of this international organization, it would be great if we could get our headquarters in Chicago to support and, and denounce communism in Mexico. And they appealed to Rotary International and said, hey, uh, you know, can you help us out? Um, Rotary International declined, and they cited their apolitical clause saying, you know, get involved in these kinds of things, we're a service club. Um, the denial disappointed and infuriated the Monterrey Rotarians, um, and they dissolved their club in protest in 1936. But the ex-Rotarians regrouped and created their own Mexican uh, service club, okay. um, called the Souls of Friendship, the Sembra de and stuff, and molded entirely after Rotary. You know, it's a business networking organization, charitable, pro-capitalist, all that good stuff, uh, <laughs> weekly lunches, pancakes, and, and all that. Good stuff. Um, but with an important added element, they promoted Catholic Hispanism. Um, Hispanismo being this you know, kind of celebration of, uh, of Catholic, uh, sorry, of Spanish culture, Catholic religion, language, and history as Mexico's true cultural identity. Um, so officially in Mexico, they were like any other service club, like Rotary or Lions, but with this important uh, agenda, promoting uh, Hispanismo. And so Hispanismo challenged in part the state's promotion of indigenismo, um, which uh, literally painted the Catholic Church and the Spaniards as kind of the villains in Mexican um, history. And, and instead they promoted this idea that no, we have to rescue our, our Hispanic roots. It was a Spanish benevolent uh, union between the Indian woman, the, the Spanish man that gave us the mestizo, and, and the church you know, embraced uh, the indígena, and so it's a much more warmer and, and uh, uh, a nicer view of the Spanish past than what the indígena offered. And so they're trying to reclaim this in part. I mean, they're also pushing back against Marxism, and, and that also relates to materialism, which, which um, I think uh, Emilio is, is right about. And so. From the 1930s, from the 36, uh, in, uh, and throughout the tenure of the PRI, the sowers of Monterrey began to work to expand throughout Mexico. Um, and by the 1950s, the early 60s, there were about 30, 32 clubs uh, throughout Mexico, with a national membership of about 1,600, 1,700. And so as service clubs, as these community 
organizations, they could advance certain community projects without appearing too Catholic or too political. So for instance, um, in the 1930s and 40s, the Sowers Club of Puebla, a very Catholic city, um, joined this national literacy campaign, um, uh, which began under Aguila Camacho. Uh, well, the, the source of friendship in, in Puebla decided to join this state-run program, but they used this opportunity of you know, teaching literacy to also teach Catholic uh, Catholicism through the, the language, through the language classes that they were getting among you know, these uh, uh, poor neighborhoods in Puebla. And there are other similar examples, which I don't, I'm going to just Yes, and then I'm going to move along. So, and so, the sowers, in the places that they, they established the club, they were very good at attracting some individuals who were later very influential people on the right in Mexico. Um, and these are my two kind of, the most important people that I, I can um, identify who were former or were members of the Sowers Friendship is Manuel Gutierrez, a very important uh, leader in Firebrand leader in the 80s, but also uh, uh, was that? Um, by the way, Kunti uh, was also a member of the Family Christian movement. So there's there's an overlap, an important overlap there. Um, so anyway, uh, very very uh, important people were part of this uh, organization. Um, now there's a bit more to the story since this is a, a, a conference about. Mexico and Mexicans in the U.S. and I would say even beyond in North America. Um, the sowers didn't limit their scope to just Mexico. They actually expanded outside of its borders and you can guess in, in the U.S. Uh, but they also went to, to Central America to El Salvador. Um, and of all places, they were in uh, West Germany. Um, they had three clubs uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and yes, that is a sarape on the wall. Um, and, well, for some reason. Um, but the interesting thing is that the more lasting presence they have outside of Mexico is in the Southwest, in places like Texas. They have still several clubs that are active in McAllen, and Corpus Christi, San Antonio, Houston, Austin. Um, and since the 60s, these, which are Mexican American, uh, populated by Mexican Americans, uh, one of the interesting things that they've done since the 60s is organize these fundraisers to give scholarships to lower income uh, Mexican Americans that they could go to the University of Texas. Um, Matthew, I think maybe um, you've heard of, of this particular scholarship. But anyway, they're, they're trying to help these lower class Mexicans go on to college. Okay, so I'll conclude with uh, just you know re reiterate kind of the big claim, the big um, point I want to get across is that you know, these charitable organizations provided, such as Rotary and, and later the Sowers, provided uh, a, a crucial, I think, vehicle for conservative Catholics, middle-class Mexicans in urban Mexico to advance their goals in, in ways that weren't too confrontational like political parties or, or um, you know, taking up arms. And, and really this is perhaps also a story of unintended consequences, right? Rotary never will thought that this would be the, the product of their, of their uh, service clubs in, in Mexico. So I'll, I'll end with that.
Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Um, I know my time is limited, but I do want to start with a round of gratitude to our organizers, Julia Young, who was the first one to reach out to me, John Pitino, Ben Fala, uh, all of our institutional sponsors, Georgetown, the Catholic University, uh, the Mexican Cultural Institute, my goodness, what a venue, uh, all of my fellow presenters. I also want to give a special thanks to Chris Sealing, uh, who did a lot of the logistical work. In, in a past life, I was an event planner, so uh, props to Chris for getting this, uh, for doing so much to get this all together. Uh, and of course, thanks to all of you, uh, all of you who in the audience who took time out of your busy days, uh, busy schedules to be here. Um, so after, after a brief sojourn in Mexico City and Monterrey, it's time to return to the countryside. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, research from my book manuscript, uh, a book manuscript that looks at the Bracero program, which how many of you here have heard of the Bracero program before? Okay, so many of you have heard of it, but for those of you who haven't, or for those of you who need a refresher, uh, the Bracero program is the unofficial name given to a series of Mexico-U.S. bilateral agreements. And what those agreements did, those agreements allowed Mexican men to work in the U.S. as seasonal contract farm workers, or braceros. Uh, the first agreement was made in the summer of 1942, continued to be renewed until it expired at the end of 1964. And during those 22 years, there were 4.6 million bracero entries. So 4.6 million bracero entries, that's the total number of contracts. When you factor in braceros who received multiple contracts, it's estimated that 1 to 2 million men participated in this. Uh, and this was a, a program that had lasting influence in, in 20th century migration because the Braceros built the type of transnational social and financial networks that migrants in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, people like my parents. Uh, my dad first came to California shortly after the Bracero program ended and then he and my mother decided to permanently settle in the U.S. in the late 1970s, early 1980s. They, they used the Bracero networks. Um, but there was a very distinct regional nature to Bracero migration. Uh, this shaded area right here, so the red dot is Mexico City, the national capital, the shaded area, sort of the old colonial heartland, uh, that's where the plurality of Braceros were from. And from four states in particular, the state of Guanajuato, the state of Jalisco, the state of Michoacán, and the state of Zacateca, states that we've already talked about before, states that the late Carlos Monsivais described as the Rosary Belt, as an, uh, as an allusion to the deeply ingrained Catholicism of, these re of this region. At least 42% of the Bracero contracts went to rural workers from these states. The Mexican government documented how 4.4 million of those 4.6 million contracts were distributed. So at least 42%, even though this is only about 20% of the population. So it's a very disproportionate uh, popular, uh, Bracero contract distribution. So these four states were the Bracero heartland, but as we know from Julia's talk earlier this morning, these states were also the epicenter of Catholic opposition to the revolutionary and the post-revolutionary governments of the PRI. Uh, they, of course, they opposed official anti-clericalism, particularly measures that were designed to limit the number of active priests in jurisdictions, they opposed a land redistribution program that called for the federal government to expropriate privately owned lands, retain ownership of those lands, and then distribute use rights. That's the way that the Mexican agrarian reform worked. Uh, conservative Catholics viewed this as an assault on the divinely sanctioned system of private property. They thought that private property was divinely ordained. It's part of the divine plan. They also opposed a secular public education curriculum that sought to engender socioeconomic class consciousness among students that also included units on family planning and sex education. They viewed this as an assault on the church's traditional role as an educator, also as an assault on the morality of Mexican children. So you have a lot of Catholic opposition. Uh, a lot of this is going to overlap with Julia's talk, so I apologize for the overlap. Uh, but during the Cristero War, uh, these are the active pieces, I think, in 1929, the last year of the war, and this is from Jean Mayer's classic study uh, of the conflict. Uh, but you can see, you can see the numbers, uh, about 60%, at least according to Mayer, 60% of active cristeros during the final year of the conflict were in these four states, particularly in Michoacán uh, and in Jalisco. Then, of course, moving on into the 1930s, uh, the Unión Nacional Sinarquista, established in León, again, 
uh, they, they, they had a particular antagonism towards General Lázaro Cárdenas, uh, former governor of Michoacán, president of the Republic from 1934 to 1940. And um, these numbers here, I mean, again, this is from Mayer's work that actually asked the question, are the sinarquistas fascists? Uh, but according to the numbers that he came up with, this, uh, you, again, you see, Guanajuato and Michoacán as the leading sinarquista states, uh, Jalisco and Zacatecas also in the top 10, 59% of the active sinarquistas in 1943 uh, in this region of Mexico. So when I began my research, I, I saw the pattern. And so my research question was, okay, well, is this a coincidence? Like, is there some kind of, well, maybe it is, maybe it is, maybe like the, maybe this, maybe this, you know, epicenter of conservative Catholic opposition has absolutely nothing to do with, you know, being the epicenter of Brasenismo, but my own family's history told me, no, there's probably something there. My family is originally from northern Michoacán, uh, from a rural rancheria named Changuitiro. I have ancestors who were cristeros. I have ancestors who were caravanistas. I have, my maternal grandfather was a bracero. My dad's two oldest brothers were braceros. Numerous great uncles were braceros. And so I'm like, no, there's probably something there. There probably is some sort of connection there. And then when I began looking at written bracero contract requests, and then at ancillary materials that documented agrarian and political conditions in Braceros and in communities, and I'm like, okay, you know what? There is a connection. Uh, there is a connection between these trends. And so I'm just going to talk about a few case studies during the time that I have left. Um, I, I cut out Zacatecas for lack of time. So my case studies are going to be from Guanajuato, Jalisco, and Michoacán. But if anyone wants to talk about Zacatecas in the Q&A or after, I'll be more than happy to. So apologies for the state of Zacatecas where my brother-in-law is from. <laughs> uh, but, but these are the case studies that I'm going to be talking about right now. Um, so the furthest one to the west is in the Jalisco municipality of Tepatitlan. The eastern ones, the northern, the northernmost of the eastern ones is Irapuato, Guanajuato. The southernmost one of the eastern ones is Burwangiro, Michoacán. I'm going to start in Irapuato, in Guanajuato. Uh, center of Cristero activity, center of Sinarquista activity. Still in the 1940s, you have conservative Catholic landowners saying, the reason that we have problems in this area is because of this wicked official agrarian policy that has destabilized our lives and ruined the domestic agricultural economy. Well, let's flash forward to 1952. 1952 was a presidential election year. That was when Alonso Ruiz Cortines, uh, who Emilio mentioned in his talk, was elected president. A month before the election, then as now Mexican presidential election for the first weekend in July. A month before the election, Manuel Rios Tibor, he was an agent of the very anodynely named Departamento de Investigaciones Políticas y Sociales, the, the Department of Political and Social Investigation uh, he was a spy. Uh, the Beats was a domestic <laughs> intelligence agency. So he goes to Irapuato, and so he's like, okay. And when you read his report, you can tell he expected to find the sinarquistas up in arms. But he said, you know what? They're not going to be a problem. I'm happy to report. They're not going to be a problem. Because the municipal president, a solid priista, Florentino Oliva, made a concerted and determined effort to remove them from the jurisdiction as Brasenos. Now, when you read that, you think, oh, okay, well, he must have just foisted these contracts upon them. But then you read between the lines, and so, and, but actually, Oliva, you know, he's a solid pista, but he gets along really well with the sinarquistas. Like, the sinarquistas agreed to tear down their propaganda posters and put up, you know, pro Ruiz Cortina's propaganda posters. Oliva doesn't get along with the PAN, the other conservative Catholic party, but the sinarquistas, he gets along with them. And then it hit me, like, and I'm, I'm sorry, I know a lot of people in Washington, D.C. are probably tired of hearing this term, but you have a quid pro quo. <laughs> it, it becomes very obvious that Oliva made an agreement. I will let you leave as Braceros. You drop any opposition to Ruiz Cortines, at least in this area. And this would have appealed to Sinarquistas, but because the national level leaders, yes, national level leaders opposed migration to the U.S., but many local Sinarquistas who had refused to participate in the agrarian reform because they legitimately thought that it condemned their souls to damnation if they did, this was a way of getting income. You go to the United States for three, six, nine months, you can earn your money over there, you can come back then to Mexico, and then go back. And there's other evidence that suggests that an agreement uh, took place. Other years that Oliva was municipal president, he would ask rural communities to send in, okay, send me your list of aspiring Braceros. There are no lists for 1952. They're conspicuously absent. Also in 1952, he did make one single announcement, but that year is the only year they asked, oh, and by the way, 
any aspiring Brazilian needs to tell me what their political affiliation is before I allow them to migrate uh, to the U.S. So you see here how it uh, how it influenced the selection of Brazilians. And I forgot to mention this. I apologize. It was municipal officials who chose which workers got the contracts. So that's why Florentino Oliva, the municipal president of Irapuato, was in a position to do what he did. So that's in Irapuato. Let's move over then to Jalisco, to Tepatitlan. And those of you who have studied the Cristero War know that Tepatitlan was Cristero, the capital of, of Cristerismo in Jalisco. Many of Jalisco's most prominent Cristero leaders, most famously Anacleto Olmos, were from Tepatitlan. In fact, any of you ever visit their parish church, they have a lovely parish church, but in the, uh, in the courtyard when you enter, they have plaques and friezes dedicated to Anacleto Olmos and the heroes of the fight for religious liberty. That's what they call the Cristiana in uh, Tepatitlan, the fight for religious liberty. And uh, opposition continued during the Segunda. Again, when you look at Segunda broadside, you know, the Cardenistas are agents of the devil or agents of the Soviet Union. It depended on which broadside you were looking at. <laughs> but the thing was, so in the Patitlan, there was very little popular support for land redistribution. Nobody there was interested. You know, in, in Guanajuato and Michoacan, you do see popular support. You also see Catholic-inspired uh, opposition. But in the Patitlan, there was very little popular support. And whenever Agrarista, supporters of the agrarian reform, tried to mobilize in the Patitlan, the conservative Catholic opposition would organize the Guardia Blanca, a private paramilitary group, and put an end to the movement. So in San Jose de Gracia, not to be confused with the San Jose de Gracia in Michoacan that Luis Gonzalez y Gonzalez famously said, there's also a San Jose de Gracia in the Patitlan. In the late 1940s, early 1950s, the agraristas there tried several times to have an opening assembly, an assembly where they would officially make their petition for an agrarian reform community to be established there. Every time they had their assembly, the Guardia Blanca would show up and put an end to it and make sure that they would not be able to get their petition off to the government. It got to the point that in the 1950s, the Patitlan's municipal officials wrote to Mexico City and said, you might want to consider having a permanent army detachment in this community because we can think of no other way to maintain the peace between the now former Cristeros and those who still want land. So opposition to the agrarian reform and lack of popular support in the Patitlan was such that between 1915, when Venusiano Carranza passed the first revolutionary agrarian reform law, through 1964, the end of the Bracero program, there's only one agrarian reform community established in the Patitlan. By contrast, in Irapuato, the municipality I spoke about right now, 65 in that same time period. In Burwandiro, the Michoacan municipality I'm going to talk about right now, 53. So during the 1950s and the 1960s, when aspiring braceros from San Jose de Gracia or from other Tepatitlan rancherias like Loma Larga and Mezcala, when they made requests for aspiring for contracts, they always said, I'm a jornalero. I'm a day laborer. You know, I don't have lands of my own to work. They would never mention that, well, I don't have lands in my own work either because I oppose the agrarian reform or because these Guardias Blancas stopped it, but they always mention that. I'm a day laborer, I don't have lands in my own to work, I'm at the whim of the state owner, so please allow me to go to the United States. And again, you know, because there was lack of popular support, because there continued to be opposition to the agrarian reform, armed opposition to the agrarian reform in Tepatitlan, that influenced the decision and the desire to migrate there. So the last case that I want to talk about, uh, and that is in Burwandiro, Michoacan. Burwandiro, uh, where you actually see both of these trends collide. So in the mid-1940s, Sinarquista sympathizers won seats on the Ayuntamiento, the municipal council. And they won over the municipal president, Martin Arroyo, to their side. And these Sinarquista Ayuntamiento members and this municipal president that they won over to their side made a deal with the local Sinarquista boss, Aristeo Aguirre, and they decided, okay, anyone who leaves Burbandiro uh, Fabracero has to be a Sinarquista. So very similar to what Oliva did in Irapuato, but here it's a reward for being a Sinarquista, sort of a reward for your participation in this cause. Yes, we know the national level leaders are saying you shouldn't migrate to the United States, and they oppose that, but we're going to give you the opportunity to go to the United States. They took control of the Brasero recruitment and selection process. They also, or at least uh, the members of the Ayuntamiento and the municipal president, also turned a blind eye to Sinarquista attacks on agrarian reform beneficiaries 
Again, despite, yes, the Sinaquista leadership, Julia did a very good job, the Sinaquista leadership, the national level leaders did espouse pacifism. But at the community level, at least in a municipality like Rwandiro, they were more than willing to continue the battles of the 1920s. So now you have Sinaquistas trying to muscle the agrarian reform beneficiaries off of their lands so that they can basically run those lands as if they were privately owned parcels. And you see Bracero requests from Burbandino, from communities like San Jose, Vipana, and others, where, and in this case, the, the aspiring Braceros were very explicit. Look, I was pushed off of my lands. I was pushed off of my land by armed opponents, they, they usually call them reactionary enemies of the government. By armed reactionary enemies of the government who are in league with local officials who have turned a blind eye to our plight. So I can't work my lands anymore. So it pains me to say this, but I need to go to the United States. And these conflicts continued into the 1960s. And in the 1960s, Burbandero's municipal officials find themselves in the same situation that the Patitlans did in the 1950s. They write to Mexico City. They say, look, the only thing that we think will keep the peace is if you send a permanent army detachment to this area. Send a permanent army detachment, we can keep the peace. Things have gotten bad. People don't want to go out because they're afraid of getting murdered. There's a number who have decided that the only chance they're going to have at peace is to emigrate to the United States. And in one of these requests, the municipal president of Urambio explicitly said, and you should know, in some of these communities, it's the same people who began fighting in the 1920s. They kept fighting. And they kept fighting. And they kept fighting. So again, they, they never challenged the national government in the same way that they did in the 1920s. But at the community level, those conflicts continued. And they influenced the selection of braceros. They influenced the individual desire to migrate. The conflicts, at least the available archival evidence, suggests that they began to taper out in the 1960s as the generations that had been involved in the Cristiana and Cardenismo began to pass away or you know, cease their active uh, political activities. But you know, as, I, as I hope this talk showed and as I hope the book manuscript will show, the Cristiano War, it, it echoed in many unexpected ways and continued echoing and it affected the migration patterns to the United States. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you for answering the questions.
in Pilsen in Chicago. <laughs> um, uh, question, who has been to Chicago? Raise your hand. Oh, I like this rum. Okay. <laughs> it's my kind of rum. Not so much in Buffalo. Um, how many people have been to Pilsen? Okay. Pilsen, one of the ten coolest neighborhoods in the world. Kind of Forbes or something. Um, a couple facts. Chicago is the second largest Mexican city in the United States. And the fact which continues to blow me away is that Mexicans have settled in Chicago for now over a century. And I'm a Chicagoan, and I drive all over the city, and it's clear, it's neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood, and I can't believe it's actually been a century. Um, and so um, what I'm going to do mostly today is talk about the second half of the 20th century, but I'm going to start us off with a little bit about the first people who came to Chicago and a, and a little bit about the first couple of churches. So this is a retablo. It's a retablo from November 101 years ago, 1918. <coughs> Matias Lara found himself lost in Chicago, and he entrusted himself to the Virgin of San Juan de los Lagos. He could not find his way in Chicago, and you'll notice as he's kneeling in front of the original Sunwan, he is showing himself in his worker's clothes. He's wearing his overalls. Um, the Virgin San Juan helped him find his way, and so therefore he made the retablo. Um, when Matias arrived, there were a couple thousand Mexicans in Chicago. Um, and um, I'm guessing he ran into one of them and they helped him find his road, but neither here nor there. Um, there. He brought his faith with him, right? And um, one thing is for sure, in 1918, there were no churches directed at Spanish-speaking people in Chicago. Um, so my book tells the story of how Mexicans have made a home in Chicago and its churches. Today, Mexicans and other Latinos are transforming the archdiocese into what I'm calling Chicago Catolico. In ways of past generations of German and Irish bishops, priests, and sisters could never have imagined. I use the Catholic parish to view Mexican immigration and transformation in the United States. For individuals arriving from Mexico, these parishes serve as a refugio. Mexicans fiercely attach themselves to specific parishes much like European ethnic groups in days gone by. It was a place to speak Spanish. It was a place to get job leads. It was a place to reminisce about Mexico. Mm -hmm. At the same time, these parishes had an Americanizing influence on Mexican members. Men and women took part in regular devotions and parish activities in ways quite similar to Polish, Italian, or Irish Catholics elsewhere in Chicago. Their children participated in May crownings of the Virgin Mary, and they played baseball on parish sports teams. At the same time, many Mexican-American lay people gained a sense of Mexicanidad by participating in religious and social events at the Mexican parishes. The parish acted as a glue that connected immigrant parents and their U.S. rear children. Um, just so I'm going to talk really briefly about the 1920s. It was just a couple years after Matias arrived in Chicago that the Archdiocese of Chicago became aware that there were a couple thousand Mexicans. Um, there was a, quite a bit of concern. Well, the Protestants had started to move in. They were starting with their little missions, and um, there was a Jesuit priest who spoke out in Chicago, and key to the story was the Claritian Missionary Fathers who were already missionizing to Mexican people in Texas and in Arizona, and they knew that Mexicans were leaving Texas, and they knew they were coming up to St. Louis and Milwaukee and Chicago and Detroit, and the Claritians basically brokered deals to open up what became Chicago's first two Mexican parishes. Uh, so the process of building a Mexican Catholic identity and community well beyond the Southwest it began in two Chicago parishes in the 1920s. We saw briefly a photo of one um, in Julia's talk, Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, near the Indiana border of Chicago. Um, and the other one is called St. Francis of Assisi, um, which is near the University of Illinois at Chicago today. Um, they have parking battles when they're sporting events in <laughs> UIC. Um, these two parishes, which were staffed by Spanish-speaking Claritian missionary priests, 
Each had a church, a rectory, a school, a convent, and a gym, and they provided a nurturing home for Mexican immigrants and Mexican American young people. The Mexican population grew in the 1940s, Braceros, Arsenal of Democracy work, the population kept expanding in the 1950s. There was still only mass at these two churches. Um, people started moving into new neighborhoods. They moved into new schools. And they moved into new parishes. And I'm going to turn our attention to the Pilsen neighborhood. And Pilsen is infamous in lots and lots of ways in Chicago. Um, it, it is Chicago's first Mexican majority neighborhood. Uh, it probably got to the point where it was probably 90, 95% Mexican in the 80s and 90s. Now there's a little gentrification, so you know, Mexicans going down to like 85%. Still a very Mexican neighborhood. And I'm going to do it from my podium and tell you a little bit about what we have here. Um, so, and we've got a little inset map here. So there's the loop, and Pilsen is just to the southwest. You get a nice good view of the Sears Tower from Pilsen. Um, and Pilsen is one of the oldest neighborhoods in Chicago. It has housing stock that predates the Chicago Fire, which was 1873. You seem like, I mean, for the Midwest, it's like. 71. Uh oh, I screwed up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, the main drag in Pilsen is called 18th Street. The, the neighborhood's about a mile and a half long, it's pretty narrow. And when Mexicans arrived in Pilsen, there were 13 Catholic parishes within a mile and a half. So it's like, great, right, you stand on the L platform, it's like, okay, St. Pius, St. Adelbert, St. Anne's, right? You can see like four church steeples. Um, so who are these people who have been living here? Um, people came into this neighborhood in like the 1860s and 70s. Um, St. Pius was the English speaking, or the neighborhood parish, right? And then all of the other parishes were national parishes for specific ethnic groups. So uh, starting here in the east, we have Providence of God built by the Lithuanians. St. Joseph, or the Slovaks. St. Procopius, 1875, built by the Czechs. Um, let's see, St. Adalbert's, basically the Polish cathedral of Pilsen, um, with lots of noise from the railroad tracks. Um, St. Vitus, another Czech parish. St. Anne's, uh, an offshoot of St. Adelbert's, also Polish. Like, they couldn't keep everybody in St. Adelbert's. <laughs> Germans at St. Paul's. Uh, here, what do we got? Uh, we got Lithuanians again, and we have some Italians. And let's not forget the Slovenians, like St. Stephen's, which is actually where Cristo Rey High School today. And last but not least, the last one of these churches built was in 1915, Holy Trinity Croatian. So all of these parishes that get built between um, about 1874 and 1915. And um, so I was wondering, what would it be like to have been the first Mexican person to come into a Slovenian parish? Or a Czech parish? Kind of guessing because the Chicago might not have been that much fun. And I I think I found the person. I was <laughs> you know in a haystack, I was looking through parish bulletins at St. Pius um, in their in the Dominicans archive, and there's the mass intentions for the week in the parish bulletin, and the one that is um, I don't remember what day of the week it was, it's a 7 a.m. and it is thanks to San Juan. They got it a little confused. I don't quite get it, it's the Virgin of San Juan. But this was a parish. It was an English-speaking parish, but a lot of Polish and Czech people there. Um, whoever that person was, I don't know who it was, man, woman, also had this faith, just like Matias Lara, in the Virgin of San Juan. Um, actually, I feel like a little bad that the press chose this for the cover, because one of the things that I found is, of course, there's all of these devotions going on. Yeah, people have a pretty strong attachment to the Virgin of Guadalupe, but that Virgin of San Juan uh, devotion in Chicago has been strong for 100 years. Um, so, um, Mexicans begin to move into the Pilsen neighborhood in the post-war, particularly after 1950, and when they want to rent an apartment, they find people that will rent them apartments. 
when they want to buy a two flat, they find that white Slavic people will, will sell them things. Um, and, and the reason why I think we've got some pretty easy movement into this neighborhood is the topic that's on the mind of every white Chicagoan in the post-war period is the uh, great increase in the African-American population and neighborhoods and um, parish priests are very concerned. Um, they know that they will experience incredible change. Churches will probably not stay open if the neighborhoods um, become African-American. So by contrast, um, people in Pilsen, the Slavic people and the priests, are relatively open-minded. And here we have a little snippet from a Catholic Charities report about the neighborhood. Um, yeah, this is the least of what I found. <laughs> Mexicans are still viewed as invaders by the older residents, many of whom still retain their own ethnic outlook and language. However, the Mexican is considered a much lesser evil than the surrounding neighbors. When the first families would come into these neighborhoods, Catholic families, and they would want to enroll their children at Catholic school, Mexican parents found that the priests would let them enroll their children. By contrast, African-American families that were living on the edge of this neighborhood, if they tried to enroll their kids at the Czech school, Polish school. Mm -hmm. Oh, does your child speak Polish? Oh, then your child can't attend here. The priest would not say that to the Mexican families. So there was like a much stronger discrimination of African Americans and some degree of inclusion for Mexicans. Um, and one of the arguments that I make is that schools and school children were some of the, these were some of the first pioneers of this sort of integration of this, I don't really want to call it biculturalism, I'm just, I guess, ethnic diversification in the neighborhood. St. Delbert School, there on the left, 1960, with their teaching sister and the little Americans all. Those are almost all Polish kids. Most of them would have been born in Chicago, Polish American. There are probably some kids who were Polish refugees. But we can see a couple faces, like look at the girls on the left. Do you see them? There's a couple girls who are Mexican. Um, and that one, sadly, I don't have the last names. On the right, we've got the 1974 class photo from St. Delbert's, proudly Polish parish. But by 1974, I think those kids are about two-thirds um, Mexican. The Polish kids are still there. They had these parishes, had these periods of overlap. It wasn't like white flight people running away right away. Um, it was a process. There was usually about two decades in which parishes really included two ethnic groups. Um, and, and I think that Catholicism offered a common ground between Slavic Chicagoans and Mexicans. Um, and priests who wanted to keep the parish schools open and wanted to keep their collection baskets still filling up were like, yeah, we're going to accept Mexican people. A little uneasy, but they, it's clear that they were talking with people and telling them they needed to welcome these strangers. Um, other sort of pioneers in the neighborhood would be businesses that came from sort of a prior Mexican neighborhood. Actually, where UIC stands today, the University of Illinois, Chicago, that had been the largest Mexican neighborhood in Chicago. There were 40,000 Mexican and Mexican-American people there. And then the university is built in um, like 60, 62, and um, all kinds of buildings are demolished. Um, and one of the um, families that had to leave that neighborhood, which became UIC, was the Bonilla family. The Bonilla families were bakers. Um, you see the gentleman holding the baby. That is uh, Francisco Bonilla uh, and his wife, Celia, and little Frank. Um, Frank gave me the photo. And, um, they had run a bakery called El Nopal. Um, when their, their uh, customers were all leaving the neighborhood, they followed their customers. The customers were moving to Pilsen. They found an old um, Slavic family. I think he might have been German. The um, white guy on the left, Mr. Fritz, had run the Ace Bakery. He sold it to the Bonillas. But look who the Bonillas brought with them for the day of sale. They brought Father Bianchi, a Claritian priest from St. Francis of Assisi, um, their old church. They brought him with to bless um, the change in the menu. 
to make this Via Crucis seven different parishes in Pilsen banded together. They planned, they rehearsed, they made costumes, they grew beards, they rented a horse to make a Good Friday of Viernes Santo that no one would forget. Priests and laity collaborated in creating a new kind of Catholic ritual for Chicago. This Via Crucis harkened back to colonial Mexican rituals and simultaneously reflected the urban Chicano experience. And there's a more recent Via Crucis. Um, and I will say, uh, in finishing up the book, I was kind of wondering, how widespread are Via Crucis? So there's this one, but in the Chicagoland area, there's about 15 more that happen every year. So it might be an individual parish or in a little village neighborhood. Again, it's like five parishes working together. Um, and um, if you Google enough, you will find out that Via Crucis has happened in places like small town Alabama and Westchester County, New York. And let's not forget the Bronx. <laughs> the Via Crucis proclaimed Pilsen as a Mexican and Catholic space in a neighborhood dominated just 15 years earlier by Poles, Czechs, and Lithuanians. Unprecedented, the Via Crucis reflected lofty goals of engaging issues of social justice and embodied an identity at once Catholic, Mexican, and Chicano. William Rodriguez's portrait with the mayor and Pilsen's Via Crucis both express a strong Mexican and Catholic identity in 1970 Chicago. Both events were unimaginable in the 20s when Matias Laras and other Mexicans first arrived in the city. Today, Chicago is the second largest Mexican metropolis in the U.S., home to a new urban mestizo culture with an identity that spans two nations. The making of Mexican parishes helped generations of immigrants create new homes and identities. But first, it was just two parishes. And um, it has influenced the neighborhood. It is not just like Catholicism within a church sanctuary. That's a three-story high mural in Pilsen that's been in place for almost 20 years. Um, St. Pius actually hired the artist to paint it. Um, and I am arguing that in episodes small and large, um, my book demonstrates how a committed Mexican lady, partnering with a sympathetic Euro-American clergy, indelibly stamped Pilsen as Catholico, Catholic and Mexican. Today, there is Misa en Español celebrated at 130 parishes in Chicago, well, the Archdiocese of Chicago. Um, as theologian Hosman Espino from Boston College puts it, Thanks to Hispanics in many parts of the country, U.S. Catholicism is de facto a bilingual reality. The saga of Latinos reshaping and often revitalizing parishes is playing out all over the United States. Thank you. Catholic movements 
in Mexico uh, facing this uh, new perspective of uh, the president? Um, well, I think um, from my point of view, I'm considering um, the posture of these Catholic social movements that we have been talking about. Um, very likely there is going to be some kind of um, conflict, maybe not the kind of conflict that we had uh, before the 1940s, but uh, up to today I think uh, some Catholic groups have actually expressed some um, some questioning about this um, usual everyday uh, conference of the president in the morning in which sometimes he seems to be preaching, sometimes he seems to be making some kind of evangelical practice. Uh, it's still uh, very superficial, I mean the critique is not very profound, but um, um, since we have a profoundly Catholic country in Mexico, um, uh, we can expect some kind of reaction, of course. Um, I, I think that's all I can say for now. Let's see what happens in the following year. Okay. Uh, just to respond as well, and of course, you know, he's an Adventist, but he has made, he has linked himself to Mexican evangelicals. Uh, Mexican evangelicals, and I think it's interesting, you know, as I recall, he did not carry the state of Guanajuato. Guanajuato was one of the few states. The, the only one. The only one. So, and Guanajuato is a state that, where the Banu remains very strong, a state that remains very proud of its sinatista and of, it, of its Catholic uh, heritage. And I remember, um, I, by sheer coincidence, I was in Zacatecas uh, when he did his press conference rally in the, I believe it was in Tijuana or Mexicali, I can't remember when he had made the agreement with the Trump administration to avoid the tariffs. And uh, an evangelical leader spoke openly in you know, very religious terms. And I remember in Zacatecas, all I well, when Vicente Fox or Felipe Calderon would do, you, you, use religious language, everyone talked was up in arms about the, the lay state and how this was a violation. And now, you know, you have this guy, but, you know, oh, so, but so because he's, because it's not a Catholic, you know, that he has up there, all of a sudden it's okay for him. So, you know, I'm with you. I, I don't think we'll see violence like what we saw in the 1920s or in the 1930s, but, you know, he, he still remains very popular. I mean, his, his popularity, his approval rating has eroded, but I think it's still in the upper 50s, lower 60s. But I, I, I can definitely see him, if he continues with this course, I can definitely see him alienating sort of more traditional, uh, more conservative Catholics as well. But who knows why? Uh, and actually, I didn't expect to jump into this conversation. But as you, <laughs> as you mentioned, that um, Guanajuato was the one place to vote against him. And I have to say this carefully. There were people who were quickly appointed to take over major historical cultural institutions under his regime. And they apparently imagined that Tutino might be a gringo historian who somehow was of shared vision. Why they came to that conclusion, I won't speculate. But uh, anyway, he's inaugurated in early December, right? It took just a little over four weeks. I was recruited to a traveling historical show <laughs> under the auspices of AMLO's appointees. And we did one event at INEM in San Angelo, the Institute for the Study of the Mexican Revolution. But then we were sent on the road to do three stops about rethinking important things in Mexican history. All three stops were in the state of Guanajuato. <laughs> um, in Celaya, San Miguel de Allende. My, I got for the first and only time I to speak in the Alondiga de Granaditos in Guanajuato. But what I want to emphasize was there was no discourse about religion. It was entirely simply to say, Guanajuato is la cuna de la historia de me. And as a team, for whatever he was doing there, this is a bit of that return compromise, right, or his people. And we're told, maybe you didn't like us for this 
perhaps religious reason, but we're here to tell you we love Guanajuato and it's important to mention in history. And I did my best. <laughs> there was one more comment on this. Uh, well, the Catholic Church, the Mexican Catholic Church has been very careful concerning uh, its relation with the current Mexican government. When the Mexican government tried to get the Mexican Catholic Church to participate in distributing this new Cartilla Moral that the government designed, uh, they totally refused to do so, as opposed to all the Pentecostal and evangelical different social movements. I think that's uh, some kind of sign. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask the author if she made use uh, of the dissertation by uh, Jorge uh, Rodriguez Mugidaki, who did a dissertation at the University of Chicago on the making of the Mexican working class in Chicago. I don't know if it's ever been but that should be enough to find it. Okay. Uh, no, I, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, about nine or ten years ago, I took a course from a survey in Latin American history. He teaches at Montgomery College in Rockville, Maryland. Okay. And I don't know if he's still there. So I, I'll just sort of add, we've had this kind of uh, great flowering of writing about Mexican Chicago in the last ten years. Uh, Gabby Arredondo, Michael Ines Jimenez, um, uh, John Flores, um, Lydia Fernandez. But I, my critique is there's pretty much a denial of Catholicism being a role. Lydia Fernandez wrote Brown in the Windy City, Puerto Rican Mexicans. She will mention churches as like being kind of a, a magnet. But the, pre, the other writers, why did people move to the near west side of Chicago? Because of Hull House. They, they came because of a settlement house. Like, they came because of St. Francis of Assisi Church. So, just a lot of, you know, kind of, I, I, I feel like I was writing against a lot of um, Mexican American historiography. At one point, when I was trying to get this book out, I was told that my book didn't have enough labor history. And I was like, that's the only history we have of the Mexican Midwest. And, you know, what did people do in Sundays? They went to billiard halls. So I was like, I think there's a, you know, so I was going to fill out that story and try and talk about a community around work. But, but thank you, and I will definitely be looking for those. You guys choose. What you have to go? Protestantism, apologies. And, you know, perhaps they were remembering that some of the most prominent 
Cardenista Agradiso, most famously Primo Tapia of Michoacán, he had converted to Protestantism uh, in, in the US. And so, I mean, this is me thinking out loud. Maybe they thought that, you know, that they'll come back. So that was one of the reasons why there was this fear among the, the, the senior Sinatista leaders at any time spent in the US poses the risk. But I, I will say one thing is that many braceros who returned to Porrandio, one, one of the municipalities that I talked about, they returned and they invested their earnings in building new parish churches in their community. So they're using their US earnings to go back to Mexico and build you know, new parroquias and new capillas and their rancherias and everything. So, I mean, unfortunately, I, I, it, would be, it would be very curious. I don't know if this falls within the scope of my work, but I, I would be curious if and how many braceros converted to Protestantism because of their time in the US. But. <laughs> Well, concerning uh, the Mexican middle class reaction to these Protestant movements, mainly in the 1960s, well, clearly the Christian family movement reacted by <laughs> trying to be more open, more, um, um, more open-minded and closer to Mexican society and the, the problems of uh, socioeconomic inequalities. And also clearly the liberation theology movement that rose by then uh, with very important Mexican representatives like uh, Bishop Mendes Arce of Cuernavaca, uh, who promoted a Catholic religion closer to uh, social problems and to the need, needs of the poorest sectors of the country. And, on the other hand, uh, Father Le Mercier, who scandalized the Vatican and the Catholic War for founding a monastery in Cuernavaca where all the monks submitted to psychoanalysis, for example. <laughs> well, those were trends that clearly reacted to this appearance of uh, the strong protagonism of the Protestant movements. I'll just say a couple of things. So, um, it's, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think it's, it's actually very, and this is you know, one of the things about history, you know, again, unexpected, unintended consequences. So the Rotary Club initially, when it attempted to go into Mexico, there was actually a lot of pushback by Mexicans because they thought um, it was this Protestant, Masonic <coughs> organization that sought to, you know, but, um, and, and during the Castillo War, some of these exiled precepts that you talk about um, started writing treaties, you know, these editorials in Catholic newspapers saying that, you know, this is the influence of these Protestant Americans and we need to resist. And so there's all this debate going on at the kind of transnational level against Rotary in Catholic countries. But the irony is that um, the, the, the service club culture actually grafted on pretty well in places like Mexico because of the, the Catholic tradition of service and of community work. And so even though this was a vaguely Protestant organization, um, it, it actually w meshed really well with, with uh, the culture in Mexico as organizations of charity. So um, that initial concern that they were these Protestant organizations um, was just moment in the early stages, and then it, it, um, it dissipated. So, um, but it's it's important to consider that in this in this context. I think. And I'll just add, in response to you know, did Rosetta actually convert? Uh, one of the best books about this, and it goes back to before the Rosetta program, is uh, Dano Rogueris's book Migrating Faith, which is about Pentecostals. He has some pretty amazing stories about when people got deported and on their train ride to Mexico and they started singing Protestant hymns and um, started converting people literally on the train back to Mexico and rejoining family on the edge of Los Angeles and starting little iglesias and communities of support. Um, I, it's a very readable book. It pays a lot of attention to hymnology and music. Um, and um, it's very, very intimate, and you, you sort of really get the sense of how this worked on the ground. So, my Great Faith by Dan Ramirez. Uh, the government of Mexico, can I stay on this topic sure. for one second? The government of Mexico, I read, was also sending out propaganda to other countries saying that they had no problem with the Protestants and they had 
the church. It only had problems with the Catholics. So that was one of the things that I came across in, in just reading in the last couple of weeks. That was when, when the U.S. government was saying, why are you having all this trouble with, um, with religion? And they said, not, not, just, not religion. Uh, the Protestants are fine. So look, look for that, too, because that's mm -hmm. some, something there also. <laughs> I'm talking about the symbols of Sembradores and uh, the, the devices that you use over there. They represent the escudo of Fernando Católico, that's, you know, the king. And then they go to the Burgos. And later on, the, the same symbol of Fernando Católico is used by Parajistas in Spain in the 20s. So you have a connection over there of symbology. And the other one is Himno Nacional Mexicano in 1930s, basically, was a sing along with the Tercera Internacional in the schools all over Mexico. Sometimes they even sing the Tercera Internacional over the Mexican thing. And then Adela Camacho comes, he brings uh, you know, the rest of the people, the, um, the people who wrote the Hino Nacional in a hombres uh, ilustres section. So that's basically what happened in Mexico. So Tercera Internacional is sing almost every other uh, ceremony. And this, the, the other thing is more is it's fighting over there. So you're casting artistas, catolicos, looking for the Mexican anthem as a way to show me to be Mexican. So there, there is this fight all over Mexico. Mm -hmm. But the international is, is the central. And talk, talking to her, uh, Calles, you know, brought the Protestantes. And in Guerra Cristera, you see in the American papers, the Ku Klux Klan endorsing <coughs> Calles. So that was supporting Calles all the time. Mm -hmm. And now Columbus on the other side in the American paper, so. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed this panel. I have a question for our Betfa. Um, these three villages, are those the focus of your project? And how did you, I'm wondering how you picked those? And then I'm assuming you've been to these villages, and I'm wondering if you still today see if these rifts are still so significant. They're not the primary focus. They, they, they show up. Um, so the way that I chose them, so I, of course I use the AGN because you can never escape the AGN, uh, no matter how hard you may try. But then I also use the state government archives of Guanajuato, Jalisco, Michoacán, Zacatecas, and also I was calientes. Uh, I was calientes um, uh, as well. And basically what I look for is, all right, I have several thousand written Bracero contract requests, and I also have information on how several thousand Bracero contracts are allocated, so I basically, okay, well, any that are high demand municipalities and also municipalities that sent, uh, those are gonna be the ones that I'm gonna focus on, and the, those three municipalities are among those that ended up, and they also just, you know, they had rich um, documentation uh, as well. Um, so that's how I came about it. So, and, and these were ones that showed up. And, you know, again, even when you read like municipal reports or something, you know, the Patitlan municipal or is it, you know, you know, the state governments of, the, of this region, by the early 1950s, they're usually asking, okay, and how many people are leaving uh, your jurisdiction? And, you know, the Patitlan, so I was like, yeah, a lot of people leave. You know, and so, you know, they, they just, they came up and I was like, okay, well, uh, I'll focus um, on that. Um, in terms of any like enduring risk, I, I think it really depends on which of the states you're in and, and what kind of tradition they have. As I mentioned, um, Jalisco and Tepatitlan, they're, they're very proud of their Cristero heritage. I mean, you see it as soon as you walk into the courtyard of the church. Um, and throughout Los Altos de Jalisco, uh, throughout the Chapala Cienegas of Tepatitlan, San Juan de los Lagos, um, Poncitlan, Ocotlan, all these Jalisco, they make no secret that they were resettled communities. Um, and so they, they very much had that. And you see something very similar in Guanajuato as well. Although they, in Guanajuato, they, you see more of the sinarquista and the panista, so more of the later. Now, Michoacán is a bit more all over the place. You, you know, Michoacán, you do have, you know, the liberal tradition and the Catholic tradition and the cardenista mujiquista uh, tradition. So I think, you know, and I, I mean, I'm biased, or I think I know a bit more directly because my family is from Michoacan. Um, I split my childhood between Michoacan and California, so I have a lot of family there. And 
you know, people still remember, yeah, my grandfather was on the Cristiano side, or my great-grandfather was on the Catanista side, or, you know, if you're me, you remember that, well, my great-grandfather and one of his brothers were Catanistas, but the other brothers were Cristeros, uh, or you remember that, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell a family anecdote here. My great-grandfather was a Catanista, he, I mean, he, if you press him on it, he would say he was Catholic, but it didn't define him. And he had very many, per family order, many famous run-ins with parish priests who threatened him with excommunication or all sorts of eternal damnation if he continued on his way. And then he said, well, I'm going to continue uh, on my way. My great-grandmother, and they had a very loving marriage. I don't want to, you know, they had a very loving marriage. I actually got to meet them before they passed away. She was very loved. She was the person in Chiquitito who organized pilgrimages to San Juan de los Lagos to visit the Virgin there. So in Michoacán, you still sort of see it. But like, you know, when I'm in Tepatitlán, they make no secret. We were Cristeros. And we're glad that we were Cristeros. When you go to Guanajuato, a lot of these communities, so like, you know, we were Sinatistas and now we're Panistas. And, you know, in Michoacán, you know, well, well, they were Catanistas, and they were Cristeros, and they were Sinatistas, and they still, you know, you know, so like, you know, my, my grandmother, she still has a portrait of General Cárdenas up in their house. <laughs> Two houses over, you have this little guy's Catholic boy. Sorry if I ran out, but I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I've I got to add one more thing. On this, when we were sent on this Morena pilgrimage to promote the right vision of the history of Guanajuato, we were all packed in a van, and we were detained and ended up accompanying the pil a mile-long pilgrimage on foot. We were between Samuel and de Guanajuato on the back roads, not on the main highways, and they were all on their way to San Juan de los Lagos. So this was ongoing a year and a half ago in January, and they were running the roads, and Emil's academic pilgrimage had to either wait or join. <laughs> <laughs> I see a question in the far back. I just had a question about Miss Quinn Chicago. Um, I visited St. Pius Church, and I was really struck by the stories that people told there about their struggles to kind of carve out space and feel comfortable um, exercising their devotional practices um, and how they kind of had to fight for room. And I, was, I, I, I found it very interesting and um, just the kind of level of, of um, joy and the struggle that people referred to in contrast to New York City where um, there was, uh, at the time I was doing my research, a very you know, semi-official acknowledgement that the church had kind of screwed up in, in holding on to the Puerto Rican population um, after the Great Migration and wanted to do better by Mexico. So there was a very officially um, sanctioned, but also very warm and sincere kind of embrace of Mexican Catholics in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and so while there was some friction with precisely Puerto Rican and Dominican parishioners who were like, well, you didn't get this welcome uh, when we came, um, there was a sense that the church was very welcoming. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. I wondered if it had to do with a difference in terms of ethnic succession and space in Chicago, or whether it maybe had to do with labor um, mobilization, whether people are just not the um, and probably so. So the, the big transition decade at St. Pius, and that was the one where in 1947 I found that mass attention. But the 1960s was really the period of the flip, where it went from majority Euro-American to majority Mexican. And I think there were some tensions. Um, you know, organizing for like the annual church fair, which now is a kermesse, right? And you know, there would be issues where like Mexican and like Slavic women gonna share the kitchen space or not, right? You know, I've, I've talked to ladies who wanted to like make enchiladas but like initially people, like the Polish people didn't know what they were and they didn't want it. Um, the cover of the book actually, this is a mural that was built into the wall at St. Pius. They created a niche space and they hired a, um, an artist from New Mexico. Um, and it's a portrait of Guadalupe devotion in Mexico and in Chicago on the two halves of the mural. 
Um, and that's been in place since um, maybe about 1972. I, you know, I think that there were the, that very first group of adults, I think there were maybe some difficulties, but you know, when they first arrived, the priests, there was nobody who would have spoken Spanish. But like by 1965, 66, the priests who ran it, and it's Dominican, it's a Dominican order church, um, they were sending priests to Berlitz to learn Spanish, and then if they had more money, they would send people to Mexico. And I, and I think it made a huge difference once the, um, once the clergy were able to speak Spanish. You were talking earlier about, uh, I guess, was it the, the League of, was it, uh, of uh, Catholic Families or something like that, United Columbus in Mexico. Uh, my question is, um, was the attitudes towards, you know, large families, birth control, feminism, abortion, homosexuality, etc., in Mexico in the 40s and 50s, similar to um, the attitudes in the United States at the same time? They're similar, you know, and is, is there like a, is there a similar baby boom in, in Mexico during the 40s and 50s, similar to the U.S. at the time after World War II? Would be nice to say comparing the attitudes uh, in the U.S. versus Mexico regarding that. Is it, is it similar? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, an important part of the uh, cultural influence of the United States of Mexico had to do with that exactly. Um, the sexual revolution in the United States had a profound impact on the Mexican middle and working class. Um, however, of course, uh, the most uh, traditional sectors of the Mexican society uh, were reluctant to acknowledge that. They were, I mean, they were still um, incorporating themselves to the sexual revolution, but in their re rhetoric, they, they were not actually recognizing that. Um, on the contrary, many of these Catholic-based movements uh, were harshly critical to that influence. It was a very contradictory process. Maybe in the practice they were doing it, but on the rhetoric and on their uh, position, um, uh, criticizing this kind of influence from the United States, they tried to preserve some of their uh, Catholic legacy, which was uh, more conservative. Status uh, as a Seventh Day Adventist, but 
you know, compared to the Catholic Church, uh, the Protestant Church in Mexico is much more decentralized and flexible as a term she used. In fact, that you know, you don't have to go to seminary, uh, you know, to be pretty much anyone can can become, you know, uh, a preacher, a pastor uh, in a Protestant church, which is, might be something that you know, perhaps could influence the growth. The fact that you don't have to go through a formal education process to be ordained, uh, and, and, and you know, I mean, this probably also goes to you know the, the old Protestant tradition that you know anyone. I mean, you don't need a priest as an intermediary. Anyone could read the Bible, and encouraging people to read the Bible uh, on their own account. So I hope I did well with that. All right. <laughs> and, and without going to, I, I guess I want to do a sort of a side response comment in that um, while that question sort of was not focusing what we were doing, we were doing this, I want to say one of the, I'd like to say most important things the Americans initially did hear about three or four years ago was bring to Georgetown. Many of you may know the Georgetown grant, deeply Catholic journalist Jason Barry, who was one of the first people who broke the child abuse scandal in the clergy going in the Hartford Current going back to the 90s. He's actually based in um, New Orleans. Um, I recently found out he has a Mexican grandmother. Um, and he's starting to work on some of those issues. And he, among other things, but he, we brought him to bring, and I want to recommend to you his book called Render Under Rome, in which he focuses in large part on Maciel and the Legion of Christ. And of course, it is a very transnational story, in yep. the sense we are, a transnational story that is not the positive side of the Catholic Church on both sides of the border and in this country. It's an amazing book, and I guess I don't mind saying this. I actually got to know him through colleagues who simply were scholars of New Orleans. And they recommended him to me, and when this came out, and I actually helped him a little bit on the historical part of the book, and he wanted to come present it. And he sent me, can we come to Georgetown? And it was late in the year, and by the way, this group, you guys are helping bottom out the Americans and the budget um, <laughs> for this year. Happy to do it. It's a great program. And he wanted to come and present this. My budget was pretty well done. So I started looking for Georgetown co-sponsors. And he's famous, and he was famous in Georgetown. And I asked our religion department, would they be willing to join and co-sponsor Jason Barrett, an alum presentation of this. No. I went to the Berkeley Center, they just wonderfully co-sponsoring us. Would they be interested and willing to co-sponsor? No, not, not that so much. I don't give up. <laughs> but at that point, the dean of Georgetown College, Chester Gillis, is a distinguished historian of Catholicism, of religion. He's a professor in the religion department. And I went to his office and I said, check. This has to come here. It's not a fun story, but it's a Georgetown story, and it's a Catholic story, and it has to happen. And I said, I need sponsorship, and I need a distinguished Catholic voice to join in the conversation with Jason. And to my incredible surprise and joy, Chet just looked at me and said, I'll pay for it, and I'll be that voice. And so after others worried, sort of at intermediate levels, the dean of the college distinguished theologian, et cetera. And we got to do this, and it was another one of our wonderful events. But all I want to say is, boy, is that a painful and important question. There's so much to do. But if you will follow Jason Barry, you can learn a lot. I, I want to just say one thing in response yeah, to your observation. Um, I, was, I worked on my project on Chicago for about 19 years. I had to publish another book first. So it kind of took a long time. When it, so there were 13 parishes in Pilsen. And um, when I, 10 years ago, there were seven parishes that remained. They were all parishes that had mass in Spanish. Maybe some also had mass in English. Today, there are three parishes that are left. I've gone to two parish closings in the last two years. And you know, it's like a big community funeral. 
And it's really interesting listening to people in these communities, either in the neighborhood or people who are parish members, talk about what's going on. They always talk about the sex abuse scandal. Well, if the archdiocese didn't have to pay lawyers, right, then maybe they could afford to keep the parish open. Or there's, you know, you know, too many Hispanics are Protestant, but I don't think that's exactly what it is in the neighborhood. Um, there's, the arch, there's the archdiocese doesn't care about Hispanics, which I don't think is true in Chicago. Like the laity in Chicago is gonna hit 50% Latino Americans, and um, it's you know, and then I will eventually hear people say that. You know, people aren't quite as religious as they used to be, like even the Mexicanos. And maybe people aren't working in the Guadalupanos in their parish, they go to a place out in the suburbs. There's a very big sanctuary shrine place um, out near O'Hare. Just, you know, or, or people will blame it on gentrification. Oh my God, there's all these Blancos moving in, and they're not, they're not religious. So, you know, I think the reality is the, the Mexicano community in the United States, it's changing, right? And um, that, build, that neighborhood was not built for one ethnic group. It was built for like 13 different ethnic groups, right? They were left with this legacy of all of these different <coughs> ethnic parishes, all these beautiful buildings, and they can't support them. Okay, okay one quick one. Uh, first, one request more than a question. Can you like send us the, all the book recommendations that you have done, like a list? Because everybody has mentioned some different books, and I embarrassed you, but I didn't have the time to write them. I think we're going to do a blog series. I don't know. Oh, sweet. Okay. We're going to get every, the panelists. Well, I think we're going to do a blog series through the Berkeley Center. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. We can probably put something meaningful together and probably.